CBC's Fifth Estate, Gaslighting You on Wood Pellets. While heat or eat poverty threatens the UK, climate activists turn against green biomass, tree slash, and forestry management in BC. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. Today I'd like to deconstruct a recent uh, CBC Fifth Estate documentary, which I think incredibly misrepresents the wood pellet industry in uh, Canada and uh, puts a lot of jobs and investment at risk. And uh, I'll walk you through what I found in just a few short hours doing some research on the internet, some important context that I think was missing from the show. And you'll decide as we go along whether or not you think I'm right that CBC is just gaslighting you about this. And of course COP27 is coming up in Egypt in November so now's the time that all the climate activists are you know drumming up whatever angst they can about anything in the world. Um, but you know it's never good enough for those guys. Doesn't matter what industry does there's always one more thing that they should have done and even if some of these people um, you know really um, in their heart they really mean good but so many of them are so misinformed about what's going on and about how industry works and they're not willing to listen or learn that it's really damaging to the economy of countries and this year in the UK it could actually kill people they have an extreme shortage of energy and let's hope that winter is mild this year because there's lots of problems in all of the EU and UK related to energy generation and wood pellet generation at the Drax plant provides about 12 percent of the power the reliable power to the grid in the UK so let's have a look and you can decide what you think about what I found and what I have to say about CPC So CBC is gaslighting you on wood pellets. The Fifth Estate just issued one of their breathless expose documentaries and they followed the path of a handful of individuals who strongly object to the Drax forestry and wood pellet arrangement with the BC government. And curiously this was hard on the heels of a suspiciously similar BBC documentary featuring many of the same actors. And I found it to be quite a similar attack on industry as CBC did in 2011 against the Alberta oil sands in their co-production, the tipping point age of the oil sands. That really did in. The oil sands destroyed its reputation worldwide. <clears throat> so I want to ask you, is shredding corporate and provincial reputations befitting this mandate? Here's CBC's mandate under the Broadcasting Act of Canada. It is to safeguard, enrich, and strengthen the cultural, political, social, and economic fabric of Canada. So as we go through this, please think about that and see if that's what they're doing. Now, this is a bit of a long presentation, so feel free to stop any time, get a coffee, and come back and have a listen at a later time even. But I do want to give you all these details. So the Fifth Estate investigates that's what they say they do. And Lindsay and her crew fly to the UK. Did we pay for their carbon offsets? I wonder. CBC seems alarmed that Canada supplies wood pellets to the UK. Well, yes, we have one of the largest forests in the world. And uh, this is the size of the UK compared to British Columbia and compared to Canada. So it's not like we're short on trees. And we do export wood pellets to the entire world, not just to the UK. And our main competitors are Russia and the US. So keep that in mind because there's always an element of either geopolitical competition or corporate competition in many of these activist actions. Now just so that people understand, wood pellets are made from leftovers. They're made from the remnants of cutting wood for lumber. And you can see here, this is from the wood pellet industry. They're giving you an example. You have this round tree 
but you're actually going to be cutting planks from trees. So that means you're going to have sawdust. See, you're going to have lumber here. Those would be the planks. You're going to have sawdust, you'll have wood chips, and you'll have bark. So all these kinds of things will be used for pellets. The lumber, of course, will be used for building. <clears throat> and they state that the Canadian wood pellet sector exists primarily to make better use of forests that are already being harvested. So those trees would have been cut down anyway. And Canada's forestry sector harvests less than 1% of Canada's commercial forests each year. And of that, less than 4% is used to make pellets. And this is entirely from sawdust, shavings, harvest res residues, and low quality logs that have been rejected by other traditional forest sectors like sawmills, pulp mills, and panel board plants. So just before we get off this section, I want to show you something. Let's imagine this is a tree. And let's imagine that we're going to cut some wood. <clears throat> so here's a couple of 2x4s, right? So see how these 2x4s fit into my tree? All this stuff, I might be able to get one more 2x4 out of it, right? But there's going to be all that waste around the outside edge. So all the bark and all the edges that don't fit, you can see even in this one, see this one, it's not exactly square on the edge, right? So um, you're always going to have waste. That's why, you know, that's why we now found a use for all that waste. And that's good because that waste would otherwise potentially be a, a wildfire or general fire hazard. Now it's turned into something useful and it's not a hazard anymore. It's actually a job creator and income earner. Um, so keep that in mind that this is how the wood pellets are made from the leftovers. They're made from the leftovers. And somehow the fifth estate missed that. They missed also that the wood pellet industry has created about 2,500 direct and indirect jobs, and that the industry provides about 750 million in economic activity and has made more than 500 million in capital investments. So this is from this uh, little uh, report, which was done by these independent people, by the way. And likewise, from this report, they state, finally, we suggest a number of important and related issues. They confirm that the wood pellet industry is not harvesting primary, ancient, or old growth forest for pellet production. They analyze the GHG implications of wood biomass, and they uh, statistically describe the importance of wood as a source of energy in the bioeconomy, and they uh, talk about improving the feedstock report system requirements so that all stakeholders and First Nations have more information on the sector while protecting the confidentiality of private sector producers. And that just makes good sense. <clears throat> Somehow, CBC Fifth Estate missed that. It was issued in September. However, if we go to the Fifth Estate program, it opens with this. This woman is flagging down a train in Britain, jumping up on top of it, and, uh, you know, releasing her diatribe about climate and wood burning and trees from the top of the train. So CBC celebrates law-breaking climate activists. And Lindsay, the reporter for Fifth Estate, claims that the activists' train stopping is desperation motivated by the UK's frantic need for electricity. Well, in fact, it's a climate activist trying to prevent 67.22 million people from having reliable electrical power. So if you've been following the news at all, daily blackouts could hit the UK this winter. Energy bills in the UK will leap by 80% this winter. 
the energy crisis. How does the UK's soaring gas and electricity compare with Europe? So these are extremely serious problems and they're mostly caused by net zero green climate activist policies and uh, they're amplified by the war between Russia and Ukraine but they were not caused by them. So let's have a look at the UK electricity generation by source. So this is from the um, IEA, the International Energy Agency, and on the graph here you can see they used to use a lot of coal and coal has been basically phased out. But now we see this huge growth in what? Natural gas. And here we see a section on biofuels and that would be um, the biofuels that Drax is burning and probably some other biofuels. And then we have um, nuclear and here we have wind and solar PV. But the problem is that these are variable and unreliable forms of power generation. They need base load backup. They need consistent, reliable power generation. And the big problem with uh, the UK this winter is natural gas prices are extremely high worldwide because there's a shortage and countries are competing for natural gas. But you need natural gas to back up wind. If you don't have some way to back up the wind, you can't run wind on the grid. Now, um, <clears throat> something that the UK and other countries have done in, on the continent is that they've quite interconnected their grids. So the UK will often get nuclear power from France or maybe some hydro or wind power from Norway. Um, so this all sounds great, right? except uh, there's a report out right now on the Global Warming Policy Foundation by a fellow named Alexander Stahl and he points out that it's really a train wreck right now in all of Europe because of these interconnected policies because they've now built grids that sort of rely on well if I'm short I can borrow from my neighbor but they're all at the point right now where they're all short they all need to borrow from the neighbor and nobody has extra power. So Norway had a very dry dry year <coughs> Excuse me, for their hydro reserves, so those are down. France has about half their nuclear fleet offline for maintenance. Germany, of course, is no longer getting gas from uh, Russia and won't be uh, to any great extent in the foreseeable future with the uh, catastrophic explosions on the Nord Stream lines. Um, uh, many of the other countries there that would normally share resources just don't have them. Even Switzerland, which is actually quite a small country, but it's also like a nexus in this whole interconnected mess. They're also facing blackouts for winter. And the same for Germany. You know, people in Germany are being told how to cook supper in their um, in their house or to keep warm using a clay pot stove and candles so you know we're talking um, a serious deterioration in electricity generation and that's why the uh, Drax plant at this point in time is not just a helpful provider it's a critical provider and that's why it's also quite strange that there's a sudden attack on them picking on them only <laughs> in the CBC documentary they didn't talk with any other wood pellet manufacturer um, then they might have had their own reasons for it maybe because it's being shipped around the world but um, you know I, I suspect there's some other competitive issue happening there anyway let's go on with this so we see here that this chunk is quite crucial to the energy security this winter and uh, we should also point out here that an independent analysis by Oxford Economics has shown that last year's renewable energy leader Drax contributed 1.8 billion pounds toward the UK economy and supported 17,800 jobs across the UK so of course with all this energy crisis millions of people will 
either be put on part-time or will lose their jobs entirely because companies can't operate with extremely high power prices. And the problem in the UK is since they phased out coal, and Drax used to be a coal producer and a coal-fired power producer, so since they phased out coal in the UK, this uh, among other coal plants, they just don't have enough <clears throat> reserve capacity, reserve capacity in the grid, and you can you can see that in this little diagram here. So we did a report in. Um, I think it was 2015, 2016, when Alberta phased out coal, and we were warning of this very thing. And even at that time, London, England was facing blackouts. Now it will be much, much worse. And you can see here how Britain's spare electricity capacity just rapidly dropped right off. And this is about the time they started relying on these interconnect lines. but. But it, it, it doesn't work. You have to be self-sufficient. And this, with emergency measures, this means they've got diesel generators all over the place in neighborhoods. <clears throat> they've got uh, systems in place to uh, constrain industry. That means that they ask ind industry to shut off at peak hours. But then they pay them very large uh, uh, repayments for that uh, constraint. And uh, that comes from taxpayers. So Britain is running on empty. There is pretty much no base load reserve capacity left. Drax began converting its coal-fired power plants to use wood pellets in 2013. By 2012, kind of a miracle happened in Canada, although it was bad for us, it was good for them. BC's forests were devastated by mountain pine beetle infestation. So this is from Natural Resources Canada. This is a reminder of the size of England and the size of BC. And Natural Resources Canada presents this map from 2012 and all the red areas show where mountain pine beetles have infested the forests and killed millions of trees. So that presents a huge wildfire risk. And here's these little suckers, the uh, mountain pine beetle. So uh, they uh, burrow into the tree and kill it from the inside. And in the early 90s, the beetle, since the early 90s, the beetle has attacked 50% of the total volume of commercial lodgepole pine in BC. By 2017, the total cumulative loss of pine that could have been sold was estimated at 752 million cubic meters, or 58% of sellable pine volume. So that means that, um, you know, just to look at my 2x4 again, where did I put it here? Just see, that means that, you know, instead of having a nice solid 2x4 like this, um, those beetles just get into the wood and they dig holes in it, they turn it into sawdust. You actually sometimes can see little uh, kind of um, trails of sawdust coming down the outside of the tree and they just kill it. So then you have all these stands of dead trees. Well, that's an open invitation to a fire because if there's a wildfire that starts down on the ground, what does it do? It, heat always rises and it can just whoosh up these dead trees and if there's a wind, you know, then it just hops from tree to tree to tree and takes off. So you can imagine millions of acres of dead trees just waiting for some anarchist to come and light a bonfire. Terrible. So, and most wildfires are caused by humans, by the way. So the pine beetle losses to the BC forestry industry. 18 million hectares of dead and damaged pine forest with an estimated 1 billion cubic meters of dead pine trees. <coughs> Excuse me. So, pine beetles equal wildfire, as I said before. Now, this is an analysis that was done by one of our contributors. And uh, he was looking at the number of wildfires. This is up to 2017, by the way. But, and they were dropping, but the numbers of kilometers, square kilometers burnt rose very dramatically, as you can see here. 
And he's thinking like, why, why is that? How can that be? So then he tried matching the pine beetle infestation. And here are the numbers on that. And of course, there is some correlation here. And the cost of fighting of wildfires, it's astronomical. So in a another set of maps here, you can see in the pink and green areas, these are impacted by the mountain pine beetle. The pink areas are most severe. And you can see this in the post uh, mountain pine beetle era, the wildfire perimeters very closely match the infestations. Now, I didn't hear anything about that in the show. Uh, they mentioned in passing that there had been pine beetles. So, enter the wood pellet industry demand. So, the wood pellet industry began in the 1990s in BC. And it was small scale at first and often for domestic use. But on a larger industrial scale, they were actually willing to pay money to harvest this scrap wood and turn it into wood pellets. <laughs> so, so that's pretty good. And that was going to be for buyers looking to green their grid with biomass, which is right in line with the Kyoto Protocol. So they're going to pay money to harvest. There was investment in developing and operating state-of-the-art facilities and provide employment opportunities in remote and rural communities. What could be better? But no, the activists say, no, this is bad. So Fifth Estate primarily follows this activist, and they don't ever really question her. You know, they have lots of questions, uh, lots of innuendo type questions about the people who work with Drax um, or about Drax motives. But they never have any questions about those of these eco-activists. And this woman is presented as a climate heroine. And uh, she's part of uh, EcoTrust, which lists many friends and funders with familiar names of organizations which were involved in the tar sands campaign, the Green Trade War Against Alberta's Oil Sands. And it says here from their brochure, that they're looking at climate finance pathways, including carbon offset projects. So they're probably kind of part of the tree planting group. Anyway, in the show, CBC says, this is the reality of BC's wood pellet industry, logs, row upon row. Well, yes. Question for the investigative journals at CBC, where do you think mill waste for wood pellets comes from? Well, as I showed you before, it comes from logs. But they see this as some kind of evidence of treason and lying because there are logs here. Well, yes, when those logs are cut and trimmed according to whatever specs that uh, facility has, the leftovers are turned into wood pellets. But these two climate heroines climb up a hill and they find up on top of the hill there's all kinds of slash here. And <clears throat> so this woman, the activist Mich uh, Michelle Connolly, says the claims that these companies make that this is green and sustainable turns that into a massive lie. And that's because they found this um, stack of slash. Slash refers to waste lumber up on top of the hill. And again I would like to go back to my 2x4. If you look at the trees behind them, they're all very thin trees. They're treetops, they're branches, they're not straight, they're not very long. So that is exactly the kind of stuff that you leave behind. Now if this happened to be close to a processing plant of any kind, then it would have been taken there. But, um, you know, it's left behind because it's not economic to take it hundreds of miles away to a plant. You know, BC is a pretty big place and they don't have these facilities everywhere. But let's go on with the show and see what happened in the documentary. 
Anyway, this woman, Michelle Connolly, thinks that it's a lie simply because some of these, um, some of this slash is left behind. And Connolly says, this forest, meaning this whole hill that was clear cut, was cut to power people's laptops or iPhones. Well, in reality, UK fuel poverty is actually killing thousands of people every year. And the forest was cut to make lumber, plywood, pulp, and paper. The residuals were made into wood pellets. So I want to draw your attention to this report from a couple of years ago, Fuel Poverty Crisis, 3,000 Britons dying every year because they can't heat their homes. It's a real crisis there. This is not about powering your iPhone. It's about actually keeping grandma alive. And so the Fifth Estate Reporter goes and gets a tour of a Drax facility there. <clears throat> and they have a gotcha moment here because, you know, after saying, well, see, you know, you've got all this stuff here that you use for making wood pellets. And they had some little glass containers here. And like, oh, so that's just made from residual lumber. And then it's like, aha, we show Aquino. This is Joe Aquino. We show Aquino what we saw in that clear cut. The very slash piles he just said Drax turns into wood pellets. And Lindsay then triumphantly shows Joe Aquino, Director of Sustainability for Drax, the images of the slash pile on the hilltop. Gotcha! Aquino explains that the pellet industry does not directly harvest the logs for the pellet industry. Okay, so there's another company that harvests the logs. These guys just get the leftovers. They get the dead trees, they get the residuals, but they don't actually, they never cut that, that hill. And then he adds, we can't go 10 hours away and grind every pile that's out there. The economics wouldn't just allow it. And Lindsay's voiceover says, but they don't say that in their videos. We still haven't heard back about that site. Ooh, wow. How about that? He just gave you a rational explanation and you won't accept it. So here's what I see in this image. I see that F CBC's fifth estate tax-funded national broadcaster is destroying tax-paying jobs and industry. Here is the tax-paying worker who is working and here is the tax-funded journal who's shredding the company reputation with innuendos. The wood pellet sector may be the bottom feeders of the forest economy using wood and forest waste that no one else wants to make a renewable fuel, but in Canada, one company alone in that space has contributed 1.1 billion in Canadian GDP and paid 277 million in taxes. And globally, Drax is also very important. 4.6 billion in GDP to the UK, Canadian and American economies in 2021 and supported 35,600 jobs. This is globally, right? So in, in, in Canada, 7,700 jobs and 2,730 in BC. So this one person is actually trying to put all these people out of work over a distorted presentation about what kind of products are being used to make their wood pellets. So the journal gotcha moment was spoiled. The Drax rep explains the economics wouldn't allow it, but that's not good enough for the fifth estate. Ha <laughs> ha. So here's some facts from a forestry expert. Those piles up on top of the hill have been raked together and allowed to cure for eventual burning. Closer to a pellet manufacturing facility and with better road access, those piles would have been chipped on site and avoided being burnt. Even the best utilization of the forest for saw logs and biomass, you can expect that 20% of the original biomass is left dispersed on the landscape. Complete removal of all woody material is neither practical or acceptable from the perspective of sustainable forest growth and habitat. 
Now the other thing that they do at the fifth estate in this show is they come up with a lot of innuendo about this woman. Her name is Diane Nichols and she was the former chief forester for BC. She left her post and accepted a job with Drax. I don't know why and neither does CBC. But the fifth estate works very hard to try and make this into something unsavory but they offer no evidence of anything untoward. And I wonder, would they try to frame the story of Catherine McKenna in a similar way? Who left her post and now has a UN position on corporate greenwashing, but there are still issues with 170, 187 billion in infrastructure projects that are unnamed or the funds unaccounted for. So why is Fifth Estate so eager to go after this individual who simply got a new job? As part of the show, they also show this and say, scars of the logging is visible from space. Yeah. You see any similarity to the patches of dead stands from the mountain pine beetle infestations? And this is the image I showed you at the beginning. So you can see all these red patches here, blobs of red patches here. All this dead wood, somebody needs to take it out because it's going to be um, sitting there waiting to be a wildfire. Now they also mention in the Fifth Estate uh, documentary that there was a, a big petition from a whole bunch of professors and economists to the EU government against wood pellets and they said trees are more valuable alive except when they're already dead or they're scrap lumber converted into useful wood pellets. So a reminder to everyone, trees, like humans, don't live forever. And it's amazing, in that letter, they say, although coal helped to save the forests of Europe, the solution to replacing coal is not to go back to burning forests, but instead to replace fossil fuels with low carbon sources, such as solar and wind. It's amazing that 796 professors and economists don't know how things are made or how the power grid operates because wind and solar are made from oil, natural gas, and coal, and lots and lots and lots of it. And you can't run wind and solar on the grid without natural gas or some other nimble form of uh, backup such as perhaps hydro. And also, in the Fifth Estate documentary, they reveal that since 1992, the Kyoto Protocol, no one noticed that there was a critical climate accounting error. Shouldn't this be the big investigative question for journals? Like, how did people miss that? So, I want to just stress that point here. You know, we've had six conferences, uh, 26 conferences of the party. 26 conferences of the party since 1992, okay? Um, and uh, in that time, no one noticed this critical error. Every year, uh, thousands of politicians, bureaucrats, climate activists go over all of the policies for these conference of the parties, climate conferences. Uh, every six years, the IPCC issues a three-part report that's usually thousands of pages long for each section, and they have hundreds of scholars and scientists and economists going over and over this information. And nobody noticed until now that there's a climate accounting error that just happens to take biomass off world markets if they implement the policies that they say should be changed. Isn't that something, hey? Um, and also in the show they interview this fellow, Duncan Brack, who was working with Chatham House and he was hired to um, or contracted to find out the emissions of the Drax power plant in the UK and he found the CO2 emissions of six to seven million passenger vehicles. Ooh boy, well let's put that in context. 
One container ship puts out the pollution of 50 million cars, and a large container ship emits the carbon dioxide of 20,000 cars. So, you know, on balance, the Drax power plant is a puff of smoke, and it's not harmful to anyone. And meanwhile, in China, of course, <laughs> here's the real emitter, China. <laughs> And here's how much coal they're burning compared to everyone else. Look at that. <laughs> so, you know, and CBC's gaslighting you about Drax. So, I would say that facts matter except to CBC's fifth estate. So according to a BC forestry expert, there's no forest license in BC that is explicitly and directly owned by Drax. And given the regulatory excess in BC required to manage a forest license, a dedicated biomass harvesting license is not economically feasible. Though a scaled log is registered against a cutting permit associated with a forest license, it is not possible to identify its forest origin. There is no way to determine the ultimate fate of a log harvested in the bush with the final product. You can only track the log to the primary scale, which may or may not be associated with the processing lumber mill facility. Logs can be scaled and then transshipped to another facility that's capable of handling the size and grade of log. Now some pellet facilities use high grade, high quality logs, processing the logs into commercial saw log dimension or cant. And a cant is a piece of wood usually over two inches thick and sawn on at least three sides, like the two by fours I've been showing you. And rendering the waste, sawdust, chips, kerf, bark, into the biomass stream. Mill waste can be used in the manufacture of both white and torrified or black pellets. However, mill waste is largely spoken for in the milling process and pellet manufacturing is sourced from salvage and harvesting waste in the bush. Currently there's about 5 million cubic meters of merchantable waste generated by harvesting and left at the harvest site. The gross waste, especially in wildfire and beetle kill stands, is significantly higher. So here are the things to ponder. BBC and CBC almost simultaneously released similar fact and context free agenda driven documentaries attacking Drax and British Columbia's industry. Stand Earth released a video entitled Beyond Burning voiced by Emma Thompson a few months ago and an outraged press release just after the CBC show. And they frame it this way, Drax was exposed for logging forests and shipping them halfway around the world to burn for electricity while claiming to use only waste wood for its massive operations. And as I've just shown you, that's not true. And Drax is not the only wood pellet contractor, but it is the sole target of the CBC Fifth Estate attack. That seems very curious to me. And Greenpeace is also attacking Drax. This all seems as coordinated an effort as was the tar sands campaign against the Alberta oil sands and some of the same actors. So who or what competitor industry or country is behind the demarketing of Canada's wood pellet industry and why is the tax funded CBC a willing tool? Why are taxpaying workers and industries forced to prop up job-destroying tax-funded CBC reporters and job-destroying tax-subsidized environmental charities, which are the friends and funders of Ecotrust? And ironically, the same people critical of wood pellet industry likely cheer on tall building construction of hybrid wood, like this mass timber building in Vancouver, which is uh, on the campus um, at UBC. <laughs> Bet there's a lot of waste from that. That probably made a lot of pellets. So 
ultimately there's no climate emergency. So all this is a facade for a green trade war against Drax and against Canada and against the people of the UK. This is Clintel, the climate intelligence group out of Holland. They're, it's an international organization. They have over 1,400 signatories now and there's no climate emergency. Uh, so uh, the media, of course, will not pick up this story. They won't talk with them. They'll interview any activist, but they won't interview Clintel. So that tells you pretty much all you need to know. Now you may wonder, well, why did we ever think there was a climate emergency? And the reason is this. It's called RCP 8.5. And this is a group of scenarios that were done for research purposes. RCP stands for Representative Concentration Pathway, which is talking about the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, green billionaires promoted this scenario, which is implausible, as if it was business as usual. So ever since 2014, this has been um, flogged about the world by environmental groups and in the finance industry as if this is our future. But the great news is that in the IPCC's report most recently, um, the one from uh, last summer, the Physical Sciences Report, they see this as very unlikely. It's an implausible scenario. In fact, they see us as being more on this 4.5 track. Now, it's important to remember that these were designed for research purposes. They're not policy pathways. They're not prescriptive in any way. Um, but they have been misused and distorted in that way. So that means there's no climate emergency. It's over. And we do have time. So we needn't put up with these eco-nutters anymore. And um, it's important to note especially because Michelle Connolly's uh, profile in the EcoTrust brochure indicated that they're into carbon financing. It's important to note that the carbon market is based on the lack of delivery of an invisible substance to no one. It's literally the emperor has no clothes. And really the question I think that uh, especially Canadian society has to ask themselves and probably now the UK as well, shall we let these wrecking balls go free? And Belgian philosopher Drew Godofridi has written this um, article uh, because of the crisis in Europe, uh, which is largely because of climate policy and these climate activists. He's asking, should we launch the trial of the century against the dark interests and tortuous sources of funding of environmental associations such as Greenpeace? And that's a good question. And I think Canadians should also ask a lot of serious questions about CBC. Because again, is shredding corporate and provincial reputations befitting to this legal mandate of CBC to serve, to safeguard, enrich, and strengthen the cultural, political, social and economic fabric of Canada. Do you think that was served by the Fifth Estates documentary? So just a note here, Friends of Science Society operates on about $150,000 a year from our members and we have a volunteer board so um, we run a pretty tight ship. I was able to find this research in the space of a few hours. Meanwhile CBC operates on more than a billion dollars a year from taxpayers. So I'd love it to ask you to donate to help us. Help us continue exposing the false narratives of the climate catastrophe media and environmental groups. So Friends of Science is an independent group of Earth, Atmospheric and Solar Scientists, Engineers and Citizens. We're celebrating our 20th year of offering climate science insights after a thorough review of a broad spectrum of literature on climate change friends of science society has concluded that the sun is the main driver of climate change and not carbon dioxide so 
I'd like to thank you all for joining me for this uh, deconstruction of the Fifth Estate show. Um, I think if you feel the way I do, it might be worthwhile to write to the CBC, phone them, um, talk with your elected representatives, and ask questions about why is the CBC attacking this industry. I mean, even if they would have shown the information that I showed you today that would have made a far more nuanced presentation. People may still have questions about why are we shipping wood pellets from Canada to um, UK or other parts of the world. It's a valid question, but um, let's ask those questions. Let's not run around with innuendo trying to destroy the lives of ordinary people. You'll notice in that documentary they didn't talk any people who actually have a job there in terms of like an ordinary worker. They didn't find out what the impact uh, of Drax was on the regional communities in terms of jobs and economic development. So um, that's hardly representative of all Canadians, is it? And it's hardly a fair representation of an industry, an important industry in Canada and one that you think they would be cheering on because it's effectively recycling waste and turning it into something useful. Anyway, you can never satisfy these people. Hopefully one or two of them might listen to reason. Maybe they'll watch this uh, program and think about it. Anyway, I'd like to thank you again for watching. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.